I would like to welcome you all this evening. I'm keeping my introduction very short because we're looking forward to a conversation. So Ed Boucher was born in Oklahoma and is living and working in LA. Pascal Koenig was Ed Boucher's first choice for this talk. And we were so glad Pascal went here right away accepted. You have known each other for almost a lifetime, and I think at the beginning of your relationship was both of your love for books, obviously. In the context of the legendary exhibition that's brought to Schmiedel, Ed Boucher and Pascal Koenig already had a joint presence here in Vienna. It was exactly 25 years ago that Ed Boucher's images covered both the gigantic facades of the Kunsthalle right here across the street and the different image, the facade of the Halle and Museum Stock here. This was 1993. Some of you here might remember that. In order to have as much time as possible for the conversation proper, I ask for your understanding that there won't be any time left for a QA period. We are opening our exhibitions at 7 p.m. And now I appreciate Mr. Security, thanking you very much for having accepted our invitation. We are all looking forward to our, your conversation. Thank you.
14th Street? Yeah, 23rd Street. Thank you. Yeah. 23rd Street. Okay, I know it was one of those busy streets in New York. And uh, uh, you, you travel around a lot, and uh, I, I knew your brother by that time. This was like in the 60s. And uh, so it was very good to uh, to know you from those from those days, and you were very active in anything that had to do with the art world. And uh, in a sense, you were all over the map. And so, uh, and I was beginning. I didn't, you know, I was kind of my eyes were closed. I was feeling my way along in this thing that they call the art world. It's very much smaller back then than it is today. I think we agree on that. Maybe. I don't know. But, um, and so I came to this, to this uh, world through uh, printing and uh, then I eventually saw that I had to make a book. And then I made what I consider uh, a painting of a book. And, and I began to do painting. So if I did something like the word as a painting, I began to feel, and artists like to kind of fantasize and live in their own world, and, uh, and so maybe I thought, well, Hulk could be really the title of a book that I've written, uh, and, and it's also, uh, I, I began to see it as possibly a sculpture, because it wasn't just a two-dimensional it came off the wall, maybe that much, like that. It's a painting, and even on the side of the painting, like the spine of the book, I would paint the word honk. So this was my, kind of my fantasy that I would be painting this uh, book cover for myself. And uh, inside this book cover would be the story that I, that I wrote with the title of Hulk. And so it moved on from there, and I kept feeling like, well, all I'm doing here really is painting book covers. And I like book covers, and, and I like books, and printing, and, and photographs that I use to make these books. And it kind of moved along in that direction. And so uh, here we are today, and I've, I've uh, expanded on that a little bit, but. It's still, uh, I have all these unanswered questions with what I'm doing. But I feel like today, is a, uh, with this exhibit here, I want to thank all these people from the session who put this together and installed this whole thing, that uh, I show my gratitude and appreciation for everything that's been done here. And, and I feel fortunate to be able to have my work like this, and uh, to try to explain these things is another subject in itself because I get involved with uh, the, these paintings of flags that I did, like this painting over here I did in 1985, and uh, um, I'm still kind of stumbling along trying to find my way, and yet I especially with that little white uh, block down at the bottom. <clears throat> and I remember um, having a particular uh, uh, mission in mind. And uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, that little white uh, dumb block or sensor strip at the bottom. I mean, so I'm not just taking a picture but I've, I've also got that little white block down there, and it's very important to me to illustrate this uh, rectangle and make it uneven so that the one side is slightly higher than the other. And I remember that being a very important element in what I was doing at the time. And uh, so I look back on it and I wonder. Well, why was that so important? I don't know what that was. That was 30-something years ago. 
maybe more. And um, so here we are today, and I'm still kind of feeling my way around. Yeah. So in a good because this is like a label, and it is a very slight. Yeah, it's a little higher on one side than on the other. Yeah. So, so that was kind of important. And then when it's kind of in a good thing, maybe one could see as a highly political painting in relation to American first, strong and so on. But that's just something which happens. So there is a continuity which also deals with painting. However, there is no hierarchy, which means a drawing, a painting, maybe it's just a question of price, but not in terms of what is more important. So, I think this is amazing. It is not, you, you are always avoiding style. You know, can conceptual, some pieces could be called pop art, but you are avoiding all these categories, all of them, that moment of 50 years. And I remember I made a proposal, kind of a childish proposal, uh, to do an exhibition with seven male names, which are kind of names like GIs, like comics, Cliff, Ed, Bill, and so on. And that was for the Gallery City in Stockholm. I had reached a point to do an exhibition for them, I got to be calm, I could stay in America, and they had an exhibition called Four Americans. There were two who had been talking for long. Sakevich and, and uh, Alfred Leslie, two others who have become icons of Rauschen and Jones. And there has to be a kind of affinity between Jones and Rauschen. And also a big difference between the Jaffa Jones American flag and his American flag. But the American flag of Jones is very definitely kind of a uh, avant-garde, whereas that of Rocher is much more uh, calm, complex, and not overtly provocative or a kind of flag and flag and flag as a kind of what uh, statement. So he's always avoiding that content matters, and it's still there, it's in it. Selection you made here because it's supposed to be patriotic, but then 
It is not patriotic of the day. It's like patriotism, the way you have a nation, you have religion, you have family. All these things are very, very uh, tricky. And sometimes a burden, but sometimes also a kind of belief. So that is something which goes through all of the work within 155 years. More or less, I guess, yeah. And uh, well, a lot of these works, especially the ones on the, the drum heads, uh, came about really by accident because I had discovered this shop in downtown LA that had a table full of uh, negative stuff, things that were uh, either broken or for sale and that were worthless. And I bought all these. Uh, from the heads, they were like rejects. There was something bad about them that could not be made into a drum. And so I bought these things and looked at them for 50 years, and I had no use for them at all. Uh, until one day I thought, well, maybe I, maybe something will happen with these. And, and that kind of started it, and then the bigger drum heads came in, and somehow I, you know, I just feel like Artists, you know, whatever they do is a diary. It's part of a diary. It's also a diabetic. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, my history had it that uh, I listened to people when I grew up that spoke this way. And I would go over to a friend's house and his mother would say, Jimmy, did you clean your room? And he'd say, I done did it. And, you know, that's like incorrect English, you know, it's a jargon, uh, particular to the Southwest United States, and uh, I never forgot that. And it also had a lot to do with double negatives. Uh, and, uh, like, I can't find my keys nowhere. Well, that means actually you can find your keys. <laughs> And all these double negatives that I was made aware of, and I thought, well, that's part of the, the part of the culture, and uh, somehow I I, I want to make that official and uh, do something about that. So uh, and that that really started something, and I didn't know what course I was on, and then I found these two clashing courses going on. With the flags, and I would do this independently. I remember looking back on my when I first became aware of American art, the painting of Jasper Johns of the flag that just floored me when I first saw it. I couldn't believe that somebody would do such a thing, and it was so stupidly obvious and so beautifully painted that I, I just it really. That threw me, and then when I heard the artist later say, people, when they look at my painting, are too busy knowing that it's a flag. And I thought, well, that's, there's something, something profound about that. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, that became sort of a point of my education. And, and then later on, here, you know, 30 years later or something, I find myself painting pictures of flags, but they're more like atmospheric flags with this one with the sky in the background, and then there's another one that's got a little nastier sky, and then finally, last year I painted one that has a black sky, and it's all falling apart. And so I thought, well, here it is. Uh, any flag that flies for 250 years deserves to be a little fragmented. But you develop a method where you think can be known themselves. So the gentleman John flag is an icon, and it's one of the lifetime kind of people. <coughs> where you manage to have a less supposedly less ambitious, immediate ambitious outcome, but it has a possibility to go to sleep and then wake up again. So, for instance, there is a period you made any and things which were kind of a reference to comics or to popular uh, culture, and then it 
was interesting to see that some of these paintings have a lot of paint on them, right? So they're almost object three dimensional. And then the next thing is the illusion of this gooey stuff, the paint on the canvas. So it becomes a totally flat thing. Also, when you started to work with uh, different uh, juices, you know, different fruits and so on, it becomes completely awful, ugly, liquid, it's really like, and very beautiful. So, these contradictions <laughs> change a lot with our taste. So there is change, and change which we don't know because we are part of the change. And I think so when you have a show at the, at the American Pavilion in Venice, it was fantastic because it was ironic in a sense, and it was very specific American. So this is the experience I had as a kid. When I came to America, I realized that Melville, Bobby Nick, um, was not world literature, but was American literature. So there is this particular flavor of, you know, American pictures, movies. So when you make a painting of Hollywood, which is all over the place on posters, Metro Gelman Mayer, it's not just iconic, it is also memory, right? Maybe not you, but that of your, your fault. And I, I like this anthropological uh, momentum, which in the books is very, very vivid. They still are extremely radical, because they avoid any sense of style. All the things which look artistic to the news, right? You made a very careful selection Binding the paper as a proper thing, then it was just what it is, like a menu. Right? So, yeah, uh, um, then we were, well, I'll back up for just a moment and think about this idea that, of the original flag that I saw that actually made me become an artist uh, in the true sense is the uh, flag painting of Pastor John's. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't design this painting. He didn't design the flag. Somebody in, in our fantasy history did this, a woman named Betsy Ross. And we're not even sure if that's correct. But supposedly Betsy Ross in 17 something sat down and uh, did the sewing by hand of these stripes and stars came to be our American flag. So, in one sense, boy, isn't this guy Jasper Johns, isn't he stealing this idea and making a painting of it? Well, we have that question even today when an artist will use an image that he finds in a newspaper. Well, uh, a lot of artists have used things that they find, they, and so I happen to believe that uh, anything is free material to use. And so um, Jasper was quite right in finding something that he used from history and not have to worry about whether he was the inventor of this image, because he wasn't. I mean, he just reinterpreted this thing. So now we have artists today who have court cases because they happen to use a photograph that somebody had used. And how about all these French street scenes that people have been painting for years? How about the guy who designed the kiosk? You know, doesn't he come along and say, hey, you can't pay a picture of my kiosk. I designed that. So, you know, it's a, an old question that becomes present day. But we've never participated in that kind of um, inflating something. Make it kind of useless versus kind of uh, protecting yourself from being incorporated. That's also something which, you know, another generation so called of uh, kind of institution critique, you've always slipped it by. There was always a tongue in cheek kind of reference, um, which 
and the front of this painting there, which looks very kind of romantic, very kind of uh, definitely like a great work of art. Then they get the line, and this line on the, it's just like sign here, right? Yeah, so, that was my thought. So it could be a different kind of line. You could you could have a democratic line, you could have a Republican line, you could have an army line, or a navy line, or whatever. So the multiplicity is interesting because I read today, I don't know if it's true, that it is the speciality of you never to sell very recent new work that you prefer to wait for a while because that people do not become too greedy, they should go back. Someone advise them because you might not want to be true, but that is being mentioned in a text that you are careful not to put your stuff right on the market, but to have people be more interested in the overall stuff. Where did you do that? <laughs>
many of them make a reference anyway, we kind of worry that soon these type of gas stations don't exist anymore. So they had a kind of melancholic momentum, which is referring back to the history of painting. And so we're very careful of making the first steps, and you have an exhibition at Alexander Jonas, who's basically a gallery from Madrid and Mata and Surrey, and he was connected by Bill Copley, right? Mm -hmm. And so when Bill suggested that you do a show in New York, you had a girl in New York, you'd be an arm, and you, know, you, you liked it and you did it. So it wasn't a kind of a hot connection, it was more connected to another type of art, basically. They're probably 20, 30 years old, most of the artists show in dollars. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those were old games, and I, uh, I always, I, I know you liked Walter Hobbs, and I always saw you as uh, almost like a double game of Walter Hobbs. You were the German Walter Hobbs, <laughs> Walter Hobbs was the American Hester Curry.
struggle with that, make it to impress each other and uh, to make the, make the world move in that direction. Yeah, then the ancient gentleman from the 60s, you have no chance to make use of it. Right? And when I saw the LA Company Museum on Fire, I interpreted it completely in a very kind of uh, personal uh, reaction because it's a kind of uh, a neoclassicist pompous building and it looked to me like the American ambassador to Berlin in 1936. And this is the kind of architecture which today is very prevalent, corporate and powerful and that it seems to be the kind of a political mood. So my misreading of your painting as if it was a political comment, it should fire, it should fire on it, is interesting because I realized that was only my point of view, but you didn't include anybody's point of view. So it's an ambivalence. It's pretty ugly too, the painting in a sense, because it's an ugly building. It's completely devoid of any social context, it's only representation. And, and in fact, there's an abstract uh, sculpture of a German art. Yeah. Yeah. I see my wife over here snickering. She, she loved that building. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so, you know, the, the building itself now is so old that it begins to have some new power and it, it has a resurgence. It actually does look good, it looks nostalgic, and there's not much of it left anymore because they've changed the facade of it and everything. And now they threaten to change the changes. And they're so eager to move on to the change. But now it has a very good karma, it has a very good atmosphere in the field, right? Fantastic people go there because they can identify with what they see, you know, oceanic arm, this and that. So it's like it depends in a good sense. Yeah. And so when I painted it, I, I, it looked to me just like let it go. I mean, I, I, I did it very innocently, and I just took the building, and I wanted to make this uh, statement of uh, being flying above uh, something and looking down on a full week or something. And I, uh, uh, my position in art at that time was like looking down on everything. I wanted the angle of things were either not looking directly down, not looking straight on like this, but an oblique angle, and that's what that building was. And I had gone over the museum in a helicopter and yeah. taken some Polaroid pictures, and that became the, the center of it. And uh, so I, I, you know, I'm not championing that style of architecture, but it was just simply subject matter to Explore. Uh, Yelma Zilio, who made this wonderful exhibition of you in uh, Greenland. Then the painting of you, which was very fantastic, it was an expensive and great painting. And there was a friend of the museum, at the museum of me, who said, No, no, I shouldn't buy this because it was made out of cranberry uh, juice or something like oh. that. Yeah. And that it could possibly disintegrate and so on. And I wouldn't outline And she said, you know, this is irresponsible, it's a museum. Uh, how will it look in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? You know? And then I said, okay, you can also put it in the bright things, you know, <laughs> then the bright canvas. Yeah. And this was the kind of sense of humor, people in Cologne life, right? And you, you show it. And, uh, and the name of the picture is for movie buffs because everybody sees from Yale yeah, from Schwann, right? She makes a connection to Vienna. So anyway, we I my generation loves, you know, American movies. And I think people who love movies have also a good sense of time, you know, one and a half hours, dark and we get out of the light again, to have you your work of lens itself to read it again and read it again and see it again yeah. and then forget about it, but it's not impressive. Yeah, no, I am uh, movies to me, like I'm, here I am in Vienna and I was introduced to this place uh, by way of Hollywood when they made that movie called The Third Man. Uh, 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 the center music, <laughs> yeah, amazing and mysterious and beautiful at the same time and so the dark streets.
trees and the chase in the streets and everything like that is a, a powerful injury and food for thought and a lot of things that happen in movies. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the advantage of movies is that they you can have a large canvas. Everything on the canvas moves. It's not frozen like we have these frozen things. Uh, and movies move. So uh, it made a, diff a big difference in my thinking. So, and I kind of learned about this when I was, I don't know, eight or ten years old, seeing movies and watching all these magnificent things happening. And, uh, and I think it's influenced the world. So that's enough about movies. Have you ever met Peter Wilder? I did. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, that's important. Vienna, and he has such a great sense of intelligence and humor. And he was interested in art, right? Yeah. He was a friend of Chinese and yes. architecture. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there were very few people in the movie business that were interested in, in the artwork more than all. You know, they didn't really collect art. I mean, there were a handful. But then also maybe when they come period, you know, change these intellectual people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, that's it for some. He made two big, big, big works. One in Museum Spartina and one at the Kunsthalle, which does not exist anymore. However, this building is very anonymous. It could be next to the highway. And you, you know, you didn't see it. You sent him home and made the home and then were executed. It was very big. I mean, it was the biggest thing I've ever done. And maybe 200 feet long or more. I don't know. Maybe more. But like, Trisha was involved in the And the architect went along with that. I think it's something like 45 meters long. Yes. Yeah. It was on a canvas that stretched on the little canvas. Yeah. Behind that canvas are windows and doors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. And it was still light shining through inside. Uh, yeah. So then we're very much for asking me to talk to you. Thank you, Jasper.